शायद जो थीम इंट्रोडक्शन है आई ट्राई टू एंड मैं हिंदी अंग्रेजी मिक्स करता रहूंगा आई ट्राई टू इंट्रोड्यूस थीम टू यू विद दर इज इंटरेस्टिंग कपलेट बाय बाय शायर हु ओरिजिनेट्स फ्रॉम लखनऊ कि कब तक द्वंद संभाला जाए कब तक युद्ध पाला जाए तू भी है राणा का वंशज फेंक जहां तक भाला जाए सो द जर्नी ऑफ फिनटेक दैट वी आर ऑब्जर्विंग फ्रॉम एन इंडिया मार्केट पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इज एसेंशियली वो जो भाला फेंकने वाली बात है ना इट्स दैट जर्नी इफ यू ऑब्जर्व इट केयरफुली एंड क्लियरली इट वॉज टू थाउजेंड नाइन टेन वेन आर बी आई केम अप विद आई एम पी एस विच एसेंशियली चेंज द वे वी कुड पे विच एसेंशियली अलाउड एनी वन टू रेमिट मनी टू एनी वन एट एनी पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम एट अ क्लिक ऑफ अ सेकेंड और इट इट सिंपली चेंज द वे वी कुड ट्रांजेक्ट बट देन इट हैड टू वेट फॉर यू पी आई टू कम सम टाइम इन टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन और सो टू एसेंशियली फंडामेंटली शिफ्ट द गियर्स वंस अगेन and that's how essentially now what you see today wherein we have approximately 6 and a half billion transactions which happened from a upi point of view which is helping us build the right railroads from a india transformation journey point of view from the point of view of us heading towards a trillion dollar opportunity from a point of view of fintech as an ecosystem बट मैं इसमें कोशिश करूंगा कि थोड़ा सा टू और एक्सपेंड आपके लिए कि व्हाट ऑल वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इन दिस We are talking about in this a possibility that in in around 24 months time frame or a lesser than that you will have around a billion dollar tra- billion transactions a day from a UPI landscape point of view, which is fundamentally a change because it will mean that so many digital footprints of consumers are getting created. One billion digital footprints a day. यकीन मानिए ये वही चीज होगी जो शायद एक अटेम्प्ट 2015-16 में गवर्नमेंट ने पी एम के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से करा था आई वाज पार्ट ऑफ दैट रूम व्हेन पी एम जे फ्रॉम अ कंसेप्चुअलाइजेशन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू केम इन एज संपूर्ण वित्तीय समावेशन जिस चीज को आप और हम आज प्रधानमंत्री जनधन योजना के रूप में जानते हैं उसका ओरिजिनल नाम था संपूर्ण वित्तीय समावेशन और ये संपूर्ण वित्तीय समावेशन के हिस्से में हो देश के उस तक एसेंशियली क्रिएटिंग एन एक्सेस टू फाइनेंशियल सर्विसेज फॉर देम वाज द ओरिएंटेशन एंड थॉट प्रोसेस इन टर्म्स ऑफ ब्रिंगिंग दैट एज अ वैल्यू चेन सो व्हाट 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 इज इट व्हिच वी आर पॉसिबली गोइंग टू ऑब्जर्व पॉसिबली इन नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी फोर मंथ्स पीरियड यू विल ऑब्जर्व अ बिलियन ट्रांजेक्शन हैपनिंग अ डे विच विल मीन दैट इट विल इम्पावर यहां आप आई से बाहर निकल करके जब थोड़ा सा आगे जाते हैं यू विल फाइंड दैट पानबीड़ी वाला जो आज की डेट में यूपीआई यूज करता है और दूसरे ट्रांजेक्शन मेथड यूज करता है it will empower all of them on top of that it is also fundamentally changing many more things jo humne shayad utne closely abhi observe nahi kari ho jaise main bhi startled tha us samay pehle pehli cheez agle 16 mahine ke andar around february 2024 and this is our prediction around february 2024 we'll have 10 crore credit cards in hand इस समय पर हिंदुस्तान में करीब आठ करोड़ क्रेडिट कार्ड हैं। वी एक्सपेक्ट दैट नंबर टू ग्रो इफ यू कंटिन्यू टू ग्रो बाय द रेट एट विच इट इज ग्रोइंग इट विल ग्रो टू अराउंड टेन करोड़ क्रेडिट कार्ड्स बाय दैट टाइम दैट्स दैट्स गोइंग टू बी अ फंडामेंटल शिफ्ट बिकॉज वी वर स्टक एट अराउंड थ्री टू फोर करोड़ क्रेडिट कार्ड फॉर द लॉन्गेस्ट टाइम दिस इज गोइंग टू बी वन बिग ड्राइवर एट दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम द सेकेंड थिंग विच पॉसिबली यू विल ऑब्जर्व फर्दर इज जो क्यू आर कोड फ्रॉम एन एक्सेप्टेंस वैल्यू चेन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू है आज की डेट में Is there? Can you can you make a wild guess? Ki, our country me, kitne QR code pasted honge? Any wild guess? The two crore QR codes which are pasted across the length and breadth of the country. Is ye jo sab data points hai, iska bada simple sa cheez hai. RBI ki website pe jaiye, RBI dot org dot in. Wahan par payment settlement ke data is available on a monthly basis. You go and at this point of time, August updated data is available. You can simply look at. what is happening from acceptance point of view what is happening from a credit issuance point of view what is happening from a upi id issuance point of view what is happening from a debit card issuance point of view ek aur interesting cheez hui pichle mahine aur wo cheez uh, october 2021 mein bhi hui thi ek bahut interesting cheez hui thi october 2021 mein which is for the first time at that point of time we crossed 1 billion cards as a country उस समय पर 92 करोड़ डेबिट कार्ड थे सॉरी 93 करोड़ डेबिट कार्ड थे और अराउंड 7 करोड़ क्रेडिट कार्ड थे दैट वाज फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम वी क्रॉस्ड डेबिट कार्ड क्रेडिट कार्ड कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ बिलियन कार्ड्स देन ऑब्वियसली बैंक्स डू क्लीनिंग अप एक्सरसाइज 
it went down again and then it came back again last to last month wherein we again have a billion cards in market and this is going to credit on UPI rails which you will possibly observe in next few weeks time or so some of the interesting players coming in interesting is the board round because as a lot of people in today's time who are sitting in the bank, large financial institution roles and responsibility be back here and who are essentially shifting out, moving out, leaving their jobs to start credit rails on UPI. They are part of higher chain. So credit on UPI is going to be a big item which you people should see and is going to be a big enabler from the point of view of adoption of car. The other thing which possibly you will revenue generation from a UPI point of view. So therefore there will be solutions which will make Revenue also, which is the right thing to do at this point of time, UPI doesn't make any money for anyone. It's just one more server cost in terms of putting an infrastructure together to essentially make it work. So that's, that is something which will gradually coming up again and again from a fintech ecosystem point of view. Hum log har saal is desh ki ek yatra karte hain. Hum log har saal 10,000 kilometer desh ka naapte hain. Every year. So pichle 4 saal mein hum log 40,000 kilometers देश का by road travel कर चुके हैं। इस process में we meet up with hundreds of startups who come and meet us in fintech space at a particular point। जब हम पहले साल शुरू करे थे उस समय हिंदुस्तान में करीब 2,500 के करीब fintech startup थे। आज की date में वो number 4,500 से 5,500 के बीच में हो चुका है। Which means in last four years the number of startups in fintech as a domain has changed and has doubled। The last piece is the interesting part is that the number of startups, while they have doubled, the people who are starting up are fundamentally of a different age group. When we started 2018, the startup founder's age was 33, 34. Now, the startup founder age is 39, 40. You won't believe, and maybe maybe some cue for Mr. Mahableshwar, if at all he thinks in that direction, which is you won't believe that now <laughs> bank CEOs are moving on and starting up. We funded a startup of a bank CEO, Karor Vashya Bank ke ek CEO the Shesh. Shesh ne ek startup shuru kari 42 cards ke naam se. And 42 cards jo hai, wo startup on cards as a rail hai, credit cards as a rail hai. And aap yakin karenge ki usme jo founder ki average age hai is 53. Average experience of founders is 30 plus years. And this is something which we are observing trend again and again. Catholic Syrian Bank ke CEO, he left and he has also started an entity. There's another CEO who is leaving, I know, and he's also started. So it's an interesting trend. So the trend that you will observe, continue to, you'll continue to observe, you'll continue to see growth in card numbers. You'll continue to see growth on adoption of payment value chains. You'll continue to see more and more senior bankers and professionals working, defining, venturing into entrepreneurship as a space. All of this will essentially take us as a nation towards the trillion dollar value chain from a fintech point of view. I'll close my remarks. I was the first time when I said to university, I was going to go to the 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 एक राह पकड़नी है हम उस तक पहुंच जाएंगे थैंक्स अ लॉट बहुत बहुत ओवर टू यू यू नो व्हेन आई लुक एट द पीपल इन दिस रूम एंड अ लॉट ऑफ द फिनटेक्स अराउंड द कंट्री इट्स एक्चुअली अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टाइम फॉर एवरीबॉडी हियर एंड द फिनटेक्स अराउंड द कंट्री व्हाट्स इंटरेस्टिंग इज दैट इन द लास्ट 10 इयर्स द इंडियाज इमेज ऑन द वर्ल्ड स्टेज हैज चेंज सब्स्टेंशियली you know, we are no longer uh, a, a country which is treated as a developing country, which is, you know, which has its own problems and so on and so forth. But I think in every single parameter, we're getting better. And I think that's a place of pride for all of us. Now, and if you look at the fintech ecosystem in India, you have, uh, like Abhishant was talking about, over four and a half thousand companies in the country. And a lot of these companies are going to be the drivers of the change for the Indian ecosystem in this decade. And I think what is amazing for me uh, to run Checkbook is that I have sort of a, have a very nice, privileged, lucky position
to be leading this, you know, leading sort of this company at this time in India's growth. And it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. Uh, so I think that's one thing that is very special about this decade especially. Uh, when we look back in the 2030s at this decade, you will see that a huge amount of transformative stuff has happened, both on the GDP side, payment acceptance, credit, insurance, all of those parameters will definitely move. What it brings for all of us, therefore, is a heavy responsibility as well. I think the responsibility is to really work pretty hard. I think we still don't have enough people in fintech or in financial services, um, especially in the startup ecosystem. There is a dearth of talent. There's a lot of reverse brain drain. I call it reverse brain drain happening from the banks to startups, uh, to fintechs especially. I think that trend will continue. And that is important for a lot of the innovation to happen. One of the key innovation that's been a game changer has been, of course, UPI, right? It's a very simple, extremely efficient product uh, that's come out of the country. But I think there's a lot more to be done in this space. And the community that I serve, for example, largely sold proprietorships. We are a new bank for small business owners. So we, we essentially serve Kirana stores, chemists, hardware shops, restaurants, and so on and so forth. And we provide them accounts, lending, and insurance. And one of the things that we've seen is that the while there is UPI penetration, the average sort of shopkeeper or the Kirana store owner or the restaurant is not financially very savvy. Uh, and I think that's the big opportunity that is part of the trillion dollar opportunity that we're talking about. I'll give you a small example. Just if you look at modernizing the stores around the country, you know, if you've seen the stores in, in the other parts of the world, they are far better looking, far better organized than in India. Just modernizing about a crore of these stores itself is a 50, 60, 100 billion dollar opportunity just to modernize them with maybe two or three lakhs of credit that they could get. And that's actually a small part of the overall working capital requirements, uh, you know, the goods and supplies, the capital requirements that they require over a period of time. And that's for a community which is about seven, eight crore customers. If you look at overall India fees, you know, today we have about 50 crore, you know, credit bureau reports in India. Uh, and out of that, you know, out of 140 crore people that we have, 130, 40, 40 crore people that we have, and out of those 50 crore, we only have about 1.3 crore sort of business loans. We have the rest which is coming into personal loans and so on and so forth. So I think there's a massive opportunity to not only increase the credit offtake, which is what something like a digital payment ecosystem is supposed to help in creating a ledger of transactions, both on the digital side. And that helps us transform all the customers who have very heavy aspirations. So I think that's where the opportunity lies, both on the, uh, one is on creating far and far better ledgers in the form of better products on the saving side. Uh, you know, it could be accounts, it could be current accounts, it could be uh, savings products and so on and so forth, which is a big opportunity. And you have a lot of new banks who are trying to do a bunch of things in that space. You also have, lending ecosystem players who are trying to use some of that technology and also use things like account aggregator information to be able to lend more effectively. So I think that's the other space that is uh, going to make a difference. I think the third one is on insurance where you have a tremendous amount of now, recent past, a lot of work that's been going on in, in the, on the insurance side to make it much more accessible, much more bite-sized. I think all these three opportunities combined together uh, in my opinion, much larger than a trillion dollar opportunity. One of the things that, you know, is very important in, that, in this process is that technology plays a very massive role. So the neo bank or the bank of tomorrow is not going to look like the bank of yesterday. Because I think the bank of yesterday was anyway, and is anyway, serving, uh, you know, through branch banking and so on and so forth. So the, the new age banks or the new age payment companies or the new age insurance providers need to look substantially different. They need to be a, a completely new entity which is using digital very effectively and is not transitioning from a physical to digital and so on and so forth. And I think one of the things that comes up over there is also the ability to take 
steps to use technology much faster. So if, uh, you know, 20 years ago if, or even five years ago, if something takes months to develop or build on a technology platform, <clears throat> most of the fintechs that we talk to and even us, we will, we will think in terms of weeks. So our sprints and checkbook on the tech side are just one week, right? And within that one week, we have to build something, deploy and test. So how that helps is that you're not sinking in cost, building something for a year and then realizing it may or may not work. And I think it's better if you're able to build something in a week, two weeks at most, deploy it. If you have a failure, you move on. And I think the main thing that you know we keep talking about is that we want to be able to make failures, but that is a, that's an ability that you can get only if you're fast enough and you're thinking micro enough in terms of how you're deploying. So that's the other. People guys, marketing guys, we all need to come together and start looking at how can I start building something just small enough and get it out. And then you will have use cases being tested very fast. And I think even RBI and the other regulatory bodies coming up with sandboxes which you can get uh, get into and start testing things is extremely critical for that success. Uh, the last thing I want to kind of say is that while there is a lot of opportunity both on the salaried segment, the self-employed segment in the country, and you have payment systems, you need to build ledgers, and then you essentially start giving credit and insurance and so on and so forth, so wealth products and so on and so forth. The interesting thing will also be how does the entire ecosystem make sure that there is much less uh, you know, frauds and so on and so forth. In the oversight, which I think the fintech industry welcomes, but also making sure there is also a lot of self-regulation that comes in so that you're not, for example, charging you know, 200 percent uh, interest rates or 25 percent processing fees and stuff like that, which we've heard at times, and make sure that it is accessible, usable, and responsible, uh, because that's the only way that there's going to be uh, real growth for the people in the country. There's a ton of opportunity. The next five years or three years, and I think Anshan was talking about some of the changes he's seeing in the next 14 months, 12 months, 15 months. The next 10 years, you will not be able to realize that you're sitting in this room over here and it, the state of things is what it is right now. You're talking about a billion a day, you'll probably get to a billion an hour. So I think that's really uh, the opportunity. You can't really fathom it, and that is what is extremely exciting about the future. There is not the scape, the scope of the uh, the exponential growth is not really known really well. Narendranath, he has joined us. Uh, welcome. He is joined Secretary National Security Council, Secretarial Government of India. Good morning to and also the cashless economy. When I look at this forum, the today's gathering, I think uh, we can draw parallel to the future digital community of India. You have the youngsters who are really tech savvy and we also have the seniors who want to catch up. So there is no divide. I can see an united uh, sort of India here because in many of the forums we keep on hearing the India as well as the Bharat. That type of uh, segregation is not here, at least in this forum. Friends, this is what is going to happen for our India in future. Digital is going to definitely unite us. Irrespective of the age group, irrespective of your geographic presence, irrespective of your uh, educational background, all such things. When I see this crowd, I recollect one of the incidents that has happened in my bank, that is Karnataka Bank, about five years back. I had just inaugurated uh, one of our e-lobbies in the city of Mysore, which is called as uh, Pensioner's Paradise. While inaugurating that e-lobby, we had provided four facilities. That is the ATM, cash withdrawal, and another is cash recycler, wherein the customers can deposit money to their accounts. And of course, the check drop box facility and uh, uh, this passbook printer facility also we had provided. Soon after the inauguration, uh, I had also had a small demo of the operation of these uh, machines. 
then i went back to my branch had interaction with my staff members and on my way back to car i saw a huge queue in front of the e lobby curiously all of them were above 60 years because my branch had good number of senior citizens and they were so curious about the e lobby and i just when i peeped into the e lobby one of the senior citizens maybe 70 years plus so excitedly explaining the how that cash recycler is functioning he himself was telling look this cash recycler can count your money irrespective of the denominations you need not put it in an orderly way second one is it takes a confirmation from you that whatever the cash that you have deposited is correct or not and instantaneously it gives a receipt by crediting to your account and all these things would happen within 20 seconds you are the best of best my cashier you all might have experienced it they take about 2 minutes to complete this process whereas in the e lobby it was happening within 20 seconds friends this is the power of technology in the banking sector when we have the meeting of the mds and ceos we always talk about this you might have seen i think uh, mr uh, anirban has made a reference to the rbi.org.in very recently they had published another data how india pays pays how many of you have seen it here they have given given a very interesting uh, data what percentage of the daily transactions that we are making is happening through the upi through the neft and rtgs through debit cards and through hard currency can you make a guess through hard currency it is just 10.7% so india has already migrated itself to the digital payment ecosystem upi nft and rtgs credit cards debit cards mobile banking internet banking day in and day out we are all involved in that things so a billion plus population country and transactions almost 89% happening on the digital channel so this has been a silent revolution in a way i think all of us should thank uh, covid-19 also during that period also you may appreciate how the indian banking system operated yes my staff people they were at risk but we did take care of the economy it was up and running sector bank these things are the changes are irreversible you look at the digital transactions now bank as a whole around 55 to 60% of the transactions are happening through the digital mode even in bank like us we belong to the first generation private sector bank have a legacy issue i will be celebrating my centenary year next year but still when we started this uh, digital transaction uh, revolution in our bank about 5 years back it was hardly in the range of 45 to 50% 45 to 48% and at that time i had gained that the digital transaction in my bank should be around 80% but today the reality is it has already reached 93% This is, this is the power of technology that I am telling you. And look at uh, not only this payment, the digital underwriting process, mm -hmm. loan sanctions. In our bank, we started this process about hardly two years back. Already in the retail loan sanctions, I have achieved a scale of seventy-five percent. Day to day, the home loans, the car loans, whatever that we are sanctioning. About 75 percent of that is getting sanctioned to the digital channel. And look at the SP accounts opening without any human intervention to the web-based as well as the tab-based tab world. We just started about six months back in our bank. Already we have reached a scale of 60 percent of the daily transactions 
there is a account opening in the SB tab of the web board. Essentially, people like me, you know, are able to get access to financial services, to um, finance and to banking services of a quality that they would not dream of unless and until they were a big company that second. And of course, Mr. Mahabaleshwar Rao has to be applauded because Karnataka Bank is a very small bank, but it has survived through the last hundred years and has kept its reputation intact. And that is a very commendable thing in uh, these days. And, uh, you know, he kind of uh, recounted some anecdotal examples of Digital India, which is always very interesting to hear. So my own anecdote about Digital India is um, actually my father. So he's 94. And by God's grace, he is in reasonable good health. His mental faculties still work. Uh, once upon a time, he was a great scientist. Uh, he's a Padma Shri and all of that. Uh, spent all his time in rural Karnataka, rural Tamil Nadu, rural uh, Maharashtra, fighting various diseases, uh, Japanese encephalitis, filariasis, malaria, um, etc. And um, now, as he lives in Chennai, and he's not able to, he's not, He's physically not very agile, but mentally extremely agile. Um, he pays his mobile subscription by card. He orders Swiggy by card. He pays all his telephone bills by card. He orders all his groceries on the web. He still writes papers uh, and opinion pieces uh, on, uh, on Word, converts them to PDF and mails it. And these are things that he learned at the age of 80 when he realized that, you know, the world has kind of uh, moved on uh, beyond him in terms of uh, being able to, you know, physically go and get access to services. Now, why I'm recounting this example is that, um, you know, Digital India has made a huge number of uh, leaps. In fact, one thing I want to echo is that this next decade from 2022 onwards to 2032 is the decade of India. I think I seriously believe it. Um, it is ours to lose. It is ours to squander. So we are in an extremely sweet spot geopolitically if you look at it. Uh, we are a large economy. We are blessed with a democratic system of government. Uh, we are stable. We have a good bureaucracy who you know think through things. These are good strengths to have. And it is up to us as entrepreneurs, bankers, and technologists to ensure that we uh, capitalize on this. Now, the success of UPI, the success of Digital India has been recounted very ably. But I just wanted to throw a few points here. So, I run a company called Boson Systems. We used to be called m -Pace Payment Systems earlier. So, we do something that is very unfashionable, which is we run a cash distribution system across cardless ATMs. We run the largest cardless ATM network in the world. And this is off a product that we built and run in India. So it is not foreign technology or entirely homegrown. What this system gives us is an ability to look at something that Digital India does not always capture, which is the use of cash. You also are regulated by the Reserve Bank of India, which means that we get access to um, the thought of the Reserve Bank of India on a regular basis because as a regulated entity, we are asked to explain and meet and talk to the RBI and we know their views on what things are. The RBI published a very interesting report in July, which is one of the most honest assessments of Digital India. And while we all know the headline, let me kind of give you the other side of the picture that this report talked about. It's on the available on the RBI website, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to download it. It's called RBI Report on Benchmarking Payment Systems 2022. It, is a, it, it, it follows from the Bank of International Settlements report, which benchmarked payments as banking systems through the pandemic. We all know that the pandemic had a certain impact on economies everywhere. One was it caused a big shift away from cash to, ca to cashless payments, what the BIS calls direct credit transfers, which is a, any kind of account-to-account -account transfer, you know, that kind of exploded during the pandemic. There was also a flight to cash. Now, this is something that we don't talk about. During the uh, pandemic, and especially in the years before the pandemic, we all know that UPI began in 2017, right? if I remember right. 2016, it was kind of laid out, but 2017, in the wake of demonetization, it was launched. It has not only, it, in, until the pandemic, it was probably increasing at a CAGR of, let us say, 60-70%, maybe more. Yes. But in the pandemic, the UPI CAGR doubled every year. Okay? 
in terms of card payments for instance upi p2m payments today is about 15 times the volume of total card payments in the country and this has happened in the last two years while this is commendable but the other thing that has happened in the last five years is ever since demonetization at which uh, in november 2016 when um, the cash in circulation uh, you know was emptied of 86 percent of 500 and 1000 rupee notes the exact number is uh, 15 lakh crores of cash was taken out out of a total CIC of 21 lakh crores. Today the CIC is 31 lakh crores and rising. And this is something that the Reserve Bank of India report acknowledges it. Now there are a few reasons why this is happening. One is the tendency of people to keep high value notes as savings. So if you don't find 2000 rupee notes in circulation most of the time, it is down to 500. Sometimes you don't find 100 rupee notes as well because you know of the way cities work. But the CIC is not just increasing uh, on account of these notes, it is also because of a big cash preference that exists in rural India. Now this is something that we have to know and understand. The second thing to note from this RBI report is that while it acknowledges it, it says that we have too few ATMs, percentage of ATMs as a percentage of CIC, cash in circulation, is among the lowest among the G20 countries. Okay, and there are some big countries in the G20 countries. China and Russia are two big countries in the G20. The United States is a third where there's a strong cash preference. We have the lowest. Now, what the implication of this would be is that when we run the IMT system and we actually have presence in rural areas where we talk about how people use uh, uh, money, the ready availability of cash in some of these places is often the best determinant of digital behavior. That when you have access, when you have the ability to convert from digital to physical cash and vice versa, and if that can be done quite easily, then it encourages digital behavior. One of the reasons why you see so much of digital behavior among the thelewalas, the flower sellers, the, your maid servants, your drivers, your cooks, your cleaners, all over Delhi, Bombay, Chennai, Bangalore, etc., is this. The number of ATMs in India is about 2,30,000. Hardly any ATMs have been deployed in the last five years, okay? But in rural India, the total number of ATMs is probably 40,000. Most of this 2,30,000 ATMs are in the cities where interchangeably you can move cash in and out, in and out of your bank account into cash and bank. The RBI report recognizes that not only that, but the vast UPI volume that we talked about among the G20 countries, payment system uh, volumes handled as a percentage of CIC is the lowest in India among the G20 countries. Now this is not to pour cold water on all the story, all the, all the, all the optimism and the enthusiasm that we uh, just heard about. The point is that if we wish to take digital India forward, we have to understand a few things. First, there is a big cash preference. So you cannot demonize people who use cash. You cannot talk down to people who use cash. And a lot of it, let me tell you very honestly, happened in the couple of years just after demonetization. Cash is not bad. Cash is not bad. But if we want to move people to digital behavior because other things become possible, we have to wean them away from cash. You cannot force people out. You have to wean them away. Right? The perception of value at risk in a digital instrument is a problem. Familiarity with apps is a problem. Familiarity, trust in these apps, trust in these payment tokens, in these payment instruments is a problem. Now, what I would do if, on, on behalf of all of us is do everything possible to at least convert someone out from a cash behavior to a non-cash behavior because a non-cash behavior is good for the economy. The CIC that India has today is 14.7% of GDP. One of the primary arguments for demonetization was that CIC was very high. At that time, CIC was 12. It is now 14.4. Between 2016 to 2022, I think our GDP has increased at least by 40 to 50 percent. So cash circulation has increased. The good news is that the Reserve Bank, who I have a lot of respect for, they are very cognizant of this. They no longer indulge in talk that you know essentially demonizes the use of cash. They recognize that this is a problem. On the other hand, they are doing everything possible to make sure that non-cash behavior is encouraged. And here I have to salute the NPCI for a new product that we are building along with. Uh, I mean, you can't, I can't say we're building with NPCI. We can only say that 
I'm getting a lot of help, support and cooperation from Mr. Dilip Pasbe and, 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 and his team where we are trying to bridge AEPS and the IMT payment system so that cash can be delivered at outlets to rural areas very easily and at low cost. So right now it is under evaluation with two banks as partners. If those two banks say we'll go ahead with this, then the next step is Dilip and I will go and meet the Reserve Bank of India CGM and we'll get his approval, take it to the AEPS steering committee, etc. The good news is that the RBI, the RBI's innovation hub in Bangalore led by the very able Rajesh Bansal, the NPCI all recognize that this is now a problem. And when I say it's a problem, it means it's a challenge. We have to figure out a way to make sure that people who are comfortable with cash are not demonized, but are weaned into digital behavior so that we can achieve our goals over the next 10 years. If, if, uh... Speaker today, he did mention about the trends for credit offtake and how some of the challenges we are overcoming over a period of time with lending players, new banking, and even in the insurance sectors. I would like to take this opportunity to convey sincere thanks to all our sponsors, and I want to thank all the delegates who came here all the way from their busy schedule and for their active participation and making the conference a great success. Thank you. A large gap exists in terms of fulfilling the credit requirement both on the retail side as well as the corporate side. World Bank estimates that there is about 27 lakh crore credit gap cumulatively for both retail and the MSME and corporate segments. It's a huge gap that needs to be filled and the entire ecosystem needs to come together from banks, fintechs and new age lenders. An interesting snippet also came out in September 2022. The credit growth in the banking system was at a multi-year high at 16.2%. This was last seen in November 2013, which is almost 10 years back. It took almost 10 years back to reach at that particular level of credit growth in that sense. Uh, so in that context only, we have uh, senior bankers with us in the panel. Mr. Mahabaneshwar and his Managing Director and CEO of Karnataka Bank. Mr. Amit Monday, Chief Revenue Officer of Euro Capital. Ms. Sristi Sethi, Chief Risk Officer, Hero FinCorp. Mr. Arindam Das, Chief Executive Officer, DMI Finance. And Ms. Devi Kavar, Head New Economy and Liabilities at RBL Bank. Welcome to all. My first question is to Mr. Mahabaneshwar, sir. Uh, this, this context of credit growth being highest at, in September 2022, um, we are possibly seeing uh, some of the major black swan events, few credit cycles. Um, in that context, wherein we are going to enable credit at scale for the next billion people, what are some of you all are and what are the things that banks, fintech and the new age lenders can together do to ensure that credit is delivered to the right and I think uh, all of you would agree with me that we are in an era of uh, disruptions and uh, that disruption is, uh, uh, this is facilitated by the digital technology and one good thing is that the entire ecosystem is having an open mind and an open eye also and uh, bankers or pushing this particular uh, digital technology not only for their payment ecosystem not only for their uh, service ecosystem but also for the lending ecosystem we have an open mind to adopt to the changed scenario as a bankers and that is where i believe that this entire thing is going to be a win-win situation. Who are going to be the winner? It is the customers, it is the bankers, and the innovators, the fintech companies or the startups. 
Yes, there are, there could be some black swan events in my own bank when I started this uh, digital transformation about four years back. We too had experienced certain black swan events. We cannot say that we are totally isolated or insulated from the black swan events. So we should be prepared to handle that type of situations also. Then I know that Ishan will ask me how you have handled that type of situations in the The one thing that we have learned as a banker is, uh, I, I come from uh, the district of Dakshina Kannada, that is Karnataka. One particular point of time, this particular district had given birth to 23 bank banks. And about two years back, we were five. Apart from Karnataka Bank, we had Kendra Bank, Syndicate Bank, Vidya Bank and Corporation Bank. At that time, whenever I used to travel, especially in the northern part of India, the people used to ask one question to me. How is that one district has given birth to so many banks? What is speciality about that particular district? A good number of fintech companies, startups, because definitely as a banker, I may not be able to develop or acquire that type of technical knowledge. But I should be able to have good monitoring and management skills. Because I know what is the requirement from the banker's point of view. Because in my email address also I highlighted, let us be exuberant, let us be optimistic. But as a banker, my call is, cautiously optimistic. So, because the risk associated with this, always it will be in the back of my mind. So, it comes down to a single point. What is your ability to understand the risk, to measure the risk, to mitigate the risk of such things? So, keeping that in mind, I think such type of rational events, I can't say that in future it will not be there, but our mindset should be like that. Yes, I am prepared to handle that type of situation. I can put umpteen number of examples, but the, the moral of the story is be optimistic, but be cautious. That's all. Okay, thank you so much for those insights. On enabling credit for the next billion people in the form of extent and statutory credit, what has been some of your learnings with these uh, kind of specific uh, fintech partnerships, especially on the digital lending? So, see, when we came in, we started our uh, Look at 
subtracted credit, if you were to take credit card as a measure, we have about uh, 8 crores uh, credit cards out there, users, user base out there. We have about 30 crores in the lending space, but we are talking about half, I mean, half a billion yes. in the next three years. So there's a huge uh, uh, path that needs to be covered. And that we are being, being very clear that that is going to be digital rails are going to be the way forward. But a couple of things in that. One is the fact that I completely agree with Mr. Mahavish, but the financing, the one on one financing uh, law or principle remains the same. In order to build a good digital lending book, you need to have good quality of assets, which means that you, that also has to be supported by a good liability base because that's where the cost of fund comes down. So you have two kinds of products. One is your utility products, where the IRR matters, where typically banks would be able to offer a better quality of products. And even if you have fintechs innovating in that, which you see a lot of fintechs doing, and they're building strong modes, fact remains that a bank can come in and take in those credits, right? So therefore, there has to be a clear arbitrage, which is where the fintechs will add value. That arbitrage could be on the lending side in terms of services or in terms of new to credit consumers or in terms of uh, consumers that are underserved right now, which is the Google base that we talk about. And the other arbitrage could be on the services side when you look at bringing in certain value additions and build building around that. So that is a clear arbitrage because otherwise you will never have the, I mean the IRM will not, the cost of funds will never allow you to create uh, strong loans. The second thing which we, we look at is the uh, cost of, I mean, the fundamentals remain the same, your cost of client acquisition. Uh, everybody is looking at that to be coming down. Uh, and secondly is your distribution cost. So both, I think, as an institution, we have looked at uh, forming partnerships uh, with technology-led companies, uh, which could assist us in reducing that year on year. So that has been a very key learning, that that's the way we look at it, whether we're looking at consumer or we're looking at home safe credit. On both sides, those partnerships exist. Um, and those have been pretty successful partnerships. Um, so largely, I think, if you were to look at the future, you're completely right, sashitization is the way forward. Uh, you have to look at how do you uh, get credit uh, quicker, easier, and uh, also in a very ethical way. Matter, to the point what Mr. Mahavish yes. was saying, that ethical lending has to be your basis. More on that later when we come to it. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Amit, uh, taking cues from both of our panelists who spoke earlier, uh, cautiously lending, being optimistic, and ensuring that you know, digital deals are rich. While I was earlier referring to the credit growth as being still 16 percent, a lot of it has also, the demand is from the MSME side as well, uh, in the form of working capital. Uh, in your experience, uh, what is it? This, what, are, what are the some of the factors that are driving you know, MSME credit in that sense? And if you really want to scale that up as well, what are the things that you're looking at? So, uh, is this everybody's been speaking about this MSME, SME credit gap? Whether it's us, whether it's a large banks, whether it's the, the, the government, uh, somehow this gap doesn't seem to be addressed, and people have been only talking about it. When we started this whole thing, we realized that the, the real problem is not carrying our baggage of how we underwrite and paint everybody in the same brush. So understanding this MSME segment was very critical. To the smaller last mile MSME, please understand that in India typically credit was always either financial based or collateral based. Go down to the last mile, the guy doesn't have an idea. He has an idea that the data is 18 months old. He has only one house. How much can he collateralize? He wants to stock up for Diwali. Where does he get his funds from? And really, this was a problem because of which the credit gap was also. Do the digital mechanism. So we really decided that on a new group that we will move away from financial based, collateral based underwriting, which really is the problem, to cash flow based underwriting. When, it comes, when we talk about cash flow based underwriting, what does it mean? It means data. So data prima facie has become the new gold in this country. Uh, data can be looked at in two ways. One is availability. 
availability data is getting democratized more and more. One is the India stack, other is the GST data. More and more data today is available with consent of the customer. And you can access the data. There is there are large banks, there are large institutions who are custodians of data, their banking, their, their banking history, their banking behavior. But has anything emerged out of that? I frankly think no. The intent, so data is that, but the intent to mine this data, create, create risk models that really suit the segment was the need of the art. I think that is what we've been able to do with our proprietary models on gross code, as we call it, which is our magic sauce. But the idea was to move away from just the regular traditional data. And, and we are sectoral based, we work in eight sectors. But even in the eight, se eight sectors, let's say there is an IVF clinic and there is a pharmacy. Does the same risk models or does the same eligibility parameters apply? The answer is no. So their, their margins are different, their cash flows are different, and so they can't be spent in the same rush. So because we were only doing SME, MSME underwriting, we had time and we had, we had, uh, we had the intent to cut across eight sectors and then hundreds of sectors and understand. But what is aiding this is data. What is delivering this data is tech. <coughs> when we talk about both data and tech, one thing that we, we should be fortunate and we should not forget is the regulator, the government, and the fintech fraternity. The regulator has been extremely proactive. The government has been proactive. They've given us the India stack. They've given us the GST, the recent guidelines on a digitization of a mortgage deal. That's there. But the other side of the fintechs which have been able to extract data, give you in the format, has, played, has, been, has been playing a very critical role, whether it's MSME, MS, or SME underwriting. So I think two pillars that will drive credit to the last mile. One is understanding the segment, sanitization of credit, understanding their cash flows or data, their needs, and then delivering it to the last mile on tech. Third important thing is the customer and his need. Every. So, this is Diwali. Pre Diwali, every bank, every MBFC wants to offer credit to the customer, but they want to offer a three year term loan. He doesn't want a three year term loan, he wants a 90 day credit. <laughs> is your data, is your engine able to read how much will he buy and how much will he pay back in 30, 90, 60 days is critical, and that is what will the right product at the affordable price is what will drive the credit growth in the next year. And even. So, uh, it's, it's a journey. Customizing that scale, so we, we didn't want to work across all the same so we work in this. We do different work in eight sectors, we decided to work in hundred sub sectors. We are, work, we are halfway through, if I may say, on these risk models that we are developing. But this will be an ever developing field as, as and when we keep accumulating, getting more data out of these segments. Uh, today I spoke about IVF clinic and pharma. Or a, or a pharma store that is in a catchment area, or a RWA, or that is on a highway. These two will be different data sets. So, are we able to really understand where the customer is, what does he want, what product does he want, what are his cash flows? And this can only happen through uh, the Google last years of data and tech. And so, yes, eventually we will be pioneers in building these sensitized mm -hmm. models for a period of time. That's interesting. Um, Swisty, I would want to come at you. Like, and, uh, you have a significant presence in tier 2 and tier 3 centers as well in terms of tubular financing. Uh, this is the exact segment that we all are talking, talking about in terms of enabling credit in the form of sanitization, customization. Uh, what have been some of your learnings in terms of enabling credit at, in those particular cities and towns and particular to that target segment? Sure. Sure. We started out as a captive finance company, uh, you know, and uh, our primary product, like all of you are aware, were tubular financing. And uh, yes, uh, in terms of really sanitization of uh, credit, which was uh, really uh, low value, high volume, uh, going to the last mile, and the underwriting was really asset based underwriting at that point of time, right? So our uh, pin codes and loan to values were very critical. But with this digitization and, and with the fintech partnerships, we are really moving on to a profile-based underwriting now. 
there is uh, so much data available and, and, and you know uh, obviously uh, also from our product suite we kind of moved away only from two wheeler to be offering unsecured consumption loans. Uh, also we have a lot of partnership with uh, fintechs uh, which could be both on a co-lending model, on a FLDG model, different uh, models that we have. So there has been a paradigm shift in terms of moving to a profile based underwriting and, and the journey has just started uh, so to say. So in the uh, traditional models, uh, you know, we were only looking at orthodox data sets in terms of uh, bureau records or in terms of track record. Now, uh, majority of these customers are new to credit. So we have to look at alternate data sources and uh, depending on the end usage, like Amit also kind of pointed out, he was talking about more MSME, I'm talking about more retail. Yes. So, you know, we, uh, the, the, you know, the tie up that we have on consumption loans, right? BNPL is another very big thing, you know, people want instant uh, credit, uh, shorter tenor, uh, and, and the digital platforms are really driving this, and this is going to be one segment, and we were talking about festive as well, right? So, uh, there is, it, it is not one size fits all, uh, pretty similar to what Amit is saying. You have to customize the products uh, to your risk appetite and the underwriting uh, paradigm has uh, completely shifted and, and uh, like Sir was just talking about in the break as well, you know, we are basically tying up with various fintechs for some of the services, building a modular model. Uh, you know, writing, uh, right starting from onboarding of a customer, right? Whether we are doing a video KYC, we are doing a OKYC, say KYC, etc. Geotagging, then uh, even the PD process for a personal loan has moved to a video uh, PD, right? So one is obviously on the cost, uh, second is on the efficiency because uh, everybody wants everything instantly now as well, right? So speed is also the essence, both in terms of our underwriting speed as well as our processing speed. But two things which are very, very critical as we are moving to the digital world is, uh, you know, your risk mitigation. So one key thing is fraud risk management, uh, which is uh, very, very key at, at this point of time. And the other is your uh, monitoring your portfolio from an early warning perspective. So uh, when I'm looking at fraud risk, typically one is on a onboarding uh, of a customer. So I need to ensure that when I'm onboarding a customer, uh, I am mitigating fraud risk to an extent. But the fraudster is very innovative. He always finds new ways, right? So uh, you know, early detection of fraud. Uh, so early detection of fraud, as well as avoidance of bulk fraud. You know, so that's another a key thing that we need to watch out for. And one important thing is fraud analytics. So I'm just building the fraud analytics piece now. You know, uh, we that is really key, and that would help, I guess, uh, you know, the REs as well as the lenders to uh, mitigate. I, I have less credit risk in the retail segment, but for me, my operational risk, my process risk, and fraud risk is where I need to really focus on based underwriting, maybe those models were built on much more thinner data uh, and old school statistics uh, based modeling and machine learning was just coming off the edge. Thanks to whatever happened in the e-commerce industry, there were a lot of goods being sold digitally thanks to the wallet company. So what we do it is, we looked at all of this and started uh, needling uh, the thread, the needle in a manner where it is dovetails, right? Like for example, we looked at if somebody is taking a loan of 25,000 rupees uh, for a period of 12 months, uh, can I go and lend the same customer like which Amit pointed out, he does not need 25,000 and for 12 months, probably his requirement was only 10,000 rupees for a period of six months or three months, but no lender was willing to listen Right? Why? Maybe they were also uh, boxed in because of their cost structure that they cannot underwrite a customer for a 10,000 rupees loan for a three months because your fixed cost will not cover whatever the earnings you will get. So challenge was to figure out that can we do. So maybe by putting in India stack, uh, repayment <coughs> stack, a digital mechanism, zero feet on street, we thought that we can profitably underwrite a, even a 10,000 rupees loan. That was the hypothesis we put on the paper and we started out the journey. Early days of our organization, DMI, we started experimenting a lot 
and we are thanks uh, to the VC community, thanks to those fintech community. Many of them probably are sitting in this room or maybe listening to this uh, casting. Uh, we learned how to reach out to customers without burning a hole, uh, what is called the customer acquisition cost, CAC, right? The large part of e-commerce industry had a bane, likes of Flipkart, likes of Snapdeal. They used to talk, I remember in 2014, 15, that we have a cap of close to $40, $60. And eventually when we sell in the seventh product or the 12th product, we can get it down to $5. Now, unfortunately, in lending industry, uh, we do not have that kind of luxury. That one customer who takes a personal loan from you, that you are hoping and praying that this customer will take seven loans or seven pro uh, products from you. So we had to figure out to get it right in the first instance. So using those tools, using the FinTech aggregators, we figured out that we can make a loan of 10,000 rupees for three months and not go into a negative margin business. Of course, the crux of the matter is underwriting strength, what kind of data we are using. Uh, my fellow panelist Shishti has already mentioned about uh, we have to look at not only the data which is coming in from the age-old bureau or somebody's bank account or somebody's traditional way of underwriting uh, the loans. It was also likes of alternate data. What is the what is the alternate data? Alternate data is a much abused word. Like if all of us keep using it. Uh, for us, alternate data is with consent, uh, which also Amit uh, pointed out. Thanks to likes of AA. Thanks to app data, uh, thanks to looking at information coming out from the EPFO data, thanks for data coming in from various application sites which we are legally scraping, so-called, right? And customer is aware of it. We will, we are able to predict a certain amount of loss, right? And that's then the beauty of science and art behind the data science models that whether it is uh, predicting the losses accurately or we have to go back and tweak something. See, the biggest effort in our kind of lending model where we have probably given loans to more than 10 million customers over the last uh, four or five years is that we were not perfect in our first model, right? In fact, we were way, way worse. Let's say we had predicted loss at 3%, it came out to be 6%. We had predicted loss at 5%, it came out at 8%. But the beauty of these data science models using the latest machine learning algorithm is that they can recalibrate very quickly using the data which is coming in tons and tons of data, right? Like when I was in my previous avatar, when I used to work with Siri, we never thought a collection data is so important. Like for example, the conversation I'm having with a customer, where the customer is talking to me, saying that I will not pay, or I will pay, but I will pay on that particular day. We never thought that it was such a useful data which can go into actually building a model, right? So thanks to the servers uh, available on the cloud, thanks to the model, we started looking at this data. Right? We started using this data to predict not only from a risk perspective, but also from a cross-sell perspective. I'm sure there are many fintech companies sitting here today have figured it out, they are already doing it, nothing unique. So there is no uh, silver bullet approach, unfortunately for us. It's a, it's more of a Occam's uh, razor approach. And it's data, uh, because we are the lender, right? We are the balance sheet. And then utilizing the data to type of customer, right? When he shops in Amazon, and when he shops in maybe Google, or maybe when he shops in an offline store called Chroma, he behaves differently for a lender. We don't have a, uh, much of an answer to this at this point in time. We are so-called discovery phase. Uh, what it means is there is a channel bias. Right? So if the model can pick it up, right, it is great because otherwise in the age old days of where we come from, 2001 and 2005, 100 square feet mom and pop store, or whether he was going to a DSA called Andromeda, we used to underwrite it similarly. Right? Maybe we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but in this world, we try to figure that channel bias, if there is a channel bias. Plus there are a lot of orthogonal data which is coming in. Uh, and uh, some of these you have to figure out, experiment, and we do experiment, uh, uh, you know, a lot. Many of them fail, right? But uh, orders which came into regulatory process, some are allowed, some are not allowed, and you know, there's still some clarity pending on some of these models, like how how do we enable FLDG and all, all other discussions around it. Uh, Mahalishu, so you have possibly seen a lot of regulations coming in uh, in the last few years. Uh, from a digital lending perspective, how do you see these new 
new guidelines coming in, uh, would do you see this impacting some of your partnerships in case you have any for that matter? It's very welcome. <laughs> As a banker, I will derive more comfort if uh, my fintech uh, partner is also subject himself for the regulations. Uh, that is the requirement and uh, going forward, see what is happening is with whomever I tie up. So uh, ultimately, since I am an RE, regulated entity, I am answerable for their good deeds as well as the bad deeds. This is what uh, the sound message the regulator has uh, uh, sent across the digital uh, ecosystem. My request and uh, uh, appeal to the fintechs as well as the startups also, make this uh, regulations related things, compliance related things, risk related things as your uh, uh, work culture. If you feel that you can deviate from these things, uh, you are not a welcome entity by those REs. It could be an NBFC or a bank or whatever it may be. So right from the beginning, that type of uh, uh, an, uh, compliance to the regulations or the guidelines, it is a must. We have to have that developed, that type of uh, uh, work culture in our respective organizations. So without that, nothing. But uh, my way of looking at it is something beyond that. If you look into the uh, REs, that is basically the financial sector, both the banking, insurance and other things, we are now in the phase of moving to the in-area system of uh, preparation of the balance sheets. I think uh, Swishti may endorse my views also. Many of the insurance companies have, and the LDFCs have also gradually moved. Uh, this NDAS, it requires uh, two types of uh, new things. One is it is data in, uh, intensive. In the sense uh, I need to have the ECL data that is the expected credit loss and I need to have the PD that is a probable default and also I need to have the LGV loss given default and based on that I have to uh, assess my portfolio based on the stage one, stage two, stage three and all. It is not related to the NPA, uh, the presently what the norms that we all have. Stress tests, various phases of cycle and various cycles that every economy and you know, uh, system will go through, right? The financial system will go through. And that convergence will be the ideal thing. So on both sides, if you were to look at it, the uh, regulator. I, I personally am a big fan because I feel we have, if not the best, one of the top three regulators and we are a very diverse country uh, with inherent issues in the way we operate, right? And the way there is very limited access. So today, if you were to, there is all this conversation around India is going to be the third largest economy in the next five years behind China and behind the US. If you look at the household debt to GDP, we are just at 37%. And uh, the other two are in the 60s and the 70s, respectively, right? So there's a long way to go to create debt, right? So digital lending is definitely the way forward. We also are very lucky that for, di for digital lending or for any digitization to take place, you need three things. One is you need a very, very strong infrastructure. We have that. Yes. We have an embedded, robust, well-tested, and most importantly, very, very affordable infrastructure. And with 5G and 4G and the, uh, you know, and Web3, as you see, uh, that we were talking about, that is only going to go better. And you will see a far better customer experience, which is going to come in by way of the fintechs leading that uh, initiative. The second thing is adoption. Pandemic has lit put, uh, has completely, uh, you know, put that to rest. The digital adoption and the penetration of mobile and web-based applications uh, have, uh, I, I think, are the, on the largest scale in India, right? We are amongst the top two countries when it comes to adoption. The third thing which is very interesting is the whole ecosystem that is now developing. And that's when I feel that the regulator is very clear. It is going to be, it's not that it's going to take place. Lending digitally is going to happen. Who is going to do it is the question. So therefore, if you see the policies and the guidelines that are coming out, 
you have to be a regulated entity. Whether you're a bank, whether you're an NDSC, whether you're a PAPG, you're a PTI license holder, you've got to be regulated. That understanding, I think nobody can now put your bury your head in the sand and say that no, no, that is going to change. No, it's not going to change. But it's going to expand, right? And again, when we look at what UPI has done, right? Look at the system. We have to create, when we talk about ecosystem, you have to create uniform standards. And by that I mean that when you have something like a UPI, now you have credit cards on the UPI, you will have cross border, the whole BPS, uh, BBPS system, and you have UPI Lite, which will tap in from a non-internet application and into a non-smart application, the 2G function. That is when the whole thing is going to really scale up. So able to discover all my assets and look at it, even I think tracking is the first form of being making it work hard for you. I think that's what I think will be the power for you and I, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, power of all of the data coming together for you, ability to see it in all in one place, make it work for you, whether you are able to take a, a loan against any of the assets that you have, whether it's a, a PF, whether it is your DMAT holdings. So how does the credit work for you? So that's for making the process easy for people. Uh, the second, which I think many of my other panelists talked about, is uh, the underserved market, whether it's the MSME or the new to credit or pe people with damaged credit. How do they all access, uh, use the power of their own data, show it on cash flow rather than asset based lending? How do they make the power of the, uh, the data being uh, available to them? And third, of course, it's a very immediate use, is for example, when COVID happened, uh, our businesses came to a standstill, especially lending, because there was a lot of offline play. Uh, whereas, uh, where some of the, uh, my uh, group company, which is Policy Bazaar, they were, their business was continuing because there were a lot of digitized processes. Uh, so here, when your uh, account statement, which is required for underwriting, is available at the touch of your button and being able to be shared without frauds and instantaneously, I think that opens up, uh, currently you might be able to operate in only say 200 cities or 300 cities in the country, whereas the, the number of cities is limitless and everybody can have access to a credit. I think these are the three or four different ways by which the account aggregator ecosystem is going to shape our, the, the personal financial lives of each of us over the next three to four years. Thanks, Radhika. Uh, I think a uh, question to Gautam now. Uh, we, we have a very diverse set of panel uh, today. And Gautam comes from the insurance sector. So I think we'll uh, get the maximum out of what a account aggregator can do from a personal finance lending alternative as well as now the insurance sector. Uh, so Gautam, I think from insurance point of view, uh, uh, many fintechs in India have been trying to digitize the whole end to end process today. Uh, however, only 16% of the policy of what I read uh, goes straight through, uh, right? And uh, having uh, the fact that all of the data of persons' finances will be in one place, how does that affect uh, the ease of use cases when it comes to person buying an insurance policy? And would we see uh, kind of a change when it comes to digitizing the insurance? Thanks, Agrika. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm basically, uh, you know, uh, I uh, come from lending by some short text and basically an uh, insurance distribution platform. I mean, similar to what uh, probably, uh, you know, like Agrika said, you know, she is her, her, her parent company, you know, Policy Bazaar. So, uh, you know, for us, uh, so insurance is a little digital model, you know, in that sense, compared to more typical lending, uh, you know, which is completely digital. Uh, and that is because, you know, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's more of a, uh, I mean, selling insurance is a, is a, is a financial advisor kind of role, uh, somebody who you really trust to be able to buy a policy, especially health and life, uh, you know, while motor has become more standardized and compulsory and simpler product. From an account integrated perspective, I think there's a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, room that is there on the insurance sector, uh, because, you know, uh, uh, I mean, and, uh, so account aggregators can play a big role, you know, uh, by sharing information across, uh, you know, motor records, you know, health records and life records. Uh, I think it's going to help, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some of the initiatives that IID is, uh, is anyways now driving in terms of uh, getting uh, access of insurance to tier 3, tier 4 and deeper towns, uh, while India stands at 1% of penetration compared to developing another, you know, even developing country, which stands at uh, minimum 3 to 4% penetration. Uh, and I think uh, with IID giving a clear mandate 
rates to other products, uh, you know, to increase the centric to, to at least 3% in the next 5 to 6 years. Uh, I think there's a huge uh, amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, potential that is there in the insurance sector uh, where this data integration can really help uh, uh, an insurance company, the insurers to better underwrite products, uh, you know, come up with, uh, you know, uh, more uh, innovative products, uh, better pricing. Uh, in which is ultimately going to lead to uh, better penetration, deeper penetration of insurance products. So I think there's a big play. Uh, insurance sector is kind of get to, I think, uh, really boom. Um, you know, uh, while a similar boom that we saw in e-commerce and uh, fintech a uh, few years back, I think insurance is the next one. Thanks, sir. To add to uh, what Gautam said, on the insurance side, if you look at it, uh, I mean, if you want to reach the tier two, three cities, you uh, you know, uh, life insurance to that segment. Uh, you need to again have access to the information um, and having a digital footprint is also required. Now that uh, as uh, you know, the UPR platform, everyone has a bank account now pretty much. Um, the A is the kind of, the A is infrastructure will fit into, uh, you know, the insurance side and then giving access to smaller uh, insurance, you know, um, that can be now achieved. The other aspect of it is now maybe someone can actually look at uh, you know financing this thing. If someone has to make a premium for paying insurance, they could also go into premium financing. So that kind of possibilities will start probably coming up. We should see you know we we'll probably see those kind of possibilities uh, with the AA ecosystem. Um, I think uh, and you know asking what you said uh, where you see it. I mean it, last October I remember we would get about 50 to 100 consents in a day where customer uh, is involved in you know giving access to their bank account and for a particular service. Right now we are seeing almost over seven to 80,000 consents in a day. So that's how it has grown. And when in October last year it was launched, there were only two ways with four banks and probably uh, two NBFCs. Right now there are over 25 banks on the ecosystem. Um, there are life insurance companies who are already adopting. Um, we've also got now over 100, 150 um, partners who are now using the A network to actually either give out a loan or uh, looking at use case on the insurance side or uh, as Garika said, on the personal finance management. So uh, that's how the ecosystem is expanding. Um, you know, so there, we've got about over a billion accounts that are now enabled on the platform. It's now a matter of the institutions to actually leverage it and use it for, you know, giving better financial and customized products to customers. Uh, so right now we are seeing over at least about a million and a half consents, uh, sorry, accounts that have got linked uh, so far, of course, there's a long way to go. Um, the other aspect of it is more additional data sets. So GST is another, uh, you know, information that will be made available on the A network, uh, besides, of course, your know, investments uh, you know, equity, mutual fund, etc. But I think GST coming up will be a major, uh, you know, game changer in terms of giving a working capital loan based on, you know, uh, cash flow based lending. So I think the ecosystem is, uh, you know, going the right direction and I probably next year the numbers will be much, I think, 10x more. I agree, I would say. Then there is a second category that looks at price on everything, right? So if they are buying a loan or be it buying a vegetable, right? They they are they look for price, uh, best price. Where will they get the best price? They are happy to look around at five different places, compare and then actually make a purchase. And then there is a third segment which is a completely access is a big problem there. Access is accessibility is not there, right? So we we talk about inclusion in those segments, etc. So. Depending on what segment that you're playing, there is a space for pretty much any beta fintech partner, beta TSP partner, or be it on the lender side also. I think they have to figure out a business model. And I know, I think uh, Arindam did talk about this uh, in the previous panel where there is a niche, I think, where uh, there, there is to play for pretty much everybody. Uh, and 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 these are all, given Indian population is so young, etc. all these spaces will grow eventually and lead to a particular path. And I'll just give a very quick example while we are on the AA panel, right? So, uh, bank, banking is not new, right? A lot of these guys that who are actually buying loans, they have bank accounts. 
bank statement was available. Bank statement digitization came into like big PDF format or a documented format came in. Then there were players who digitized it, digitized it right? We heard about Perfure, as you are of the world. And this is the next level of evolution. And probably the entire journey has taken about a decade, right? Almost uh, from where we were to where we are. And I think in the similar space, I think each of these, uh, you know, contributors or partners, let's say, even a lender is a partner, right? Or, or, or the one who is sourcing the customer as a partner will evolve and, and can become a huge business. So, and then the good part about India is it's a growing country, uh, moving very fast, young country, so adoption will be probably quicker than uh, a decade what we have seen in maybe in a simple bank statement journey.